you deploy, go to other countries, and you try to help these other citizens in those countries, and you do that because you believe that you're trying to give them a sliver of what we have here in America. And then you retire one day and you realize, after spending 24 years in the military, multiple combat deployments all over the world, you realize that we have children in our own backyard that have it worse than the kids that I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're here with Richard Ojeda, state senator from West Virginia, running for Congress. A lot of people talk about you as the guy who kind of sparked the, the teacher strikes in, in, in West Virginia. You gave a, a, a speech on the floor that said, you know, the teachers, you know, if, if you keep treating them this way, they're going to rise up and they ought to rise up. And then they did. Was that, were you surprised? I spent four years, after I retired from the United States Army, I spent four years in the classroom. And every day I sit and, and, and we would talk during like lunch, you know, about PEIA, about the low salaries, about how we were losing our teachers. Even in the school that I was at, the teachers were leaving when they, you know, got the opportunity. You know, when you are taught math, science, English, things like that by the assistant to the assistant wrestling coach, because a science teacher left for greener pastures and we needed to fill somebody, we needed to fill those boots, we just grabbed the nearest person and said, you're now this. And that is exactly what happens. And I've seen it you firsthand. Read, read the science textbook. And oh, go. oh, absolutely. I mean, I have Absolutely. That is exactly. I mean, I, I remember watching the assistant football coach teach Spanish. God bless him for stepping up to the plate and trying his best. But the truth is, is that, you know, will our kids be ready? You know, when you come from an area like I come from, where everybody lives at the poverty line or below, pretty much, the majority of people do, uh, you know, college is something that is already tough for these kids. If you're going to have to go and spend the first year taking the 098 classes that don't count towards your graduate, you know, your, your degree, people can't afford that. So I got up and, 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 I, and I went ahead and kind of spoke about that, but I spoke also about the fact that we're losing our teachers because we're not listening to our teachers. And then what happened is after that speech, it was a six minute and seven second speech, I started getting phone calls from teachers saying, hey, we wanna ha we're having a meeting and we'd like for you to attend. And I would go to those meetings and you know what? I could tell they were ready. Uh, Mingo County, you know, these are people, I love them. And let me tell you, Boone County, these are places where I'm from. These people will fight you, and they, won't take, they will not take, you know, they're not going to take your garbage. <clears throat> and they have been pushed for far too long. You can only kick a dog so many times before it rips you apart. So, you know, uh, they were in a room in Mingo County, and a man that was in there, he was married to a teacher. He stood up, and he had a UMWA shirt on. And he says, let me tell you all something. He says, if you're going to do this, you got to do it together, and you cannot you cannot stop. Do not let them break you. And I'm going to tell you, they made the decision. Mingo County was the first ones. But as soon as Mingo County said, Boone County said. Uh, 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 Wyoming County said. And then it spread. The labor organizations joined in. On day five, when you walked outside, you didn't just see teachers, school service personnel. You saw the United Mine Workers of America. Was that the Capitol? Yes, yeah. you saw painters, Teamsters, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. They stood together strong, and they all had their voices heard. And in the end, what happened? You know, we had our, you know, Patrick Morsey threatened to, to, to you know, uh, you know, do an in, uh, in, injunction on the teachers, you know, went around, specifically tried to speak with superintendents to, to, to villainize these teachers. All the legislators were doing that uh, on, on the other side. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you right now, the teachers, they say, oh, it's illegal to strike. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to fire me? You already treat me like garbage. If you want 728 vacancies to become 1,700 uh, vacancies overnight, then keep doing what you're doing. And they won. So how did you get into politics? When did you, as when, when people talk about it, they say, not, not a typical politician. Well, I retired from the United States Army, and I, I come home. And when I got home, I was sickened at what I saw. You know, I spent 24 years in the military. I got four trips, uh, you know, to, to combat zones. Uh, I was in Haiti for the earthquake. You know, I've been all over. I spent so much time away from my family, a year in Korea, two years in Germany. I spent a lot of time away from my wife and my kids. And, uh, you know, I've lost brothers that I love dearly. And then you come home, you know, you live in a bubble in the military. You get to believe that it's all about the beans and the bullets. That's how come, that's how come military folks are mostly Republican because they only focus on who's going to give me the beans and the bullets that I need to be able to accomplish my mission. And historically, Republicans have really been the most generous to the, 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 the military. 
So that's why a lot of people that are in the military, you know, are that way. But you retire or you get out of the military after spending a significant amount of time and you come home and you realize that, you know, when we deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, we said we're willing to go over here and risk our lives to give these people a sliver of what we enjoy in America because we're the greatest nation on earth. And then you come home and you realize it's a lie. We got homelessness all over the place. This is Washington, D.C. They're all over the place here, you know. We've got an opioid epidemic that is ripping our communities apart and making it the basically episodes of The Walking Dead, except for real, you know? And nobody does anything to stand up to big pharma. We lost more people last year than all the lives lost in the Vietnam War. Who's the enemy here? You come into our country and you crash buildings, and you crash airplanes into our buildings. We've been at war now for almost 20 years. But big pharma has killed over, uh, killed uh, you know uh, uh, more people than, than all the lives lost in the Vietnam War, and we're going to sit quiet and continue just to look the other way because lobbyists grease people's pockets. No. When did you first run for state senate? In 2014. I ran in 2014 because we had people that were in those positions that had gotten away. they forgot they forgot what being a Democrat was really about. They thought, okay, now it's just about me showing up right before the election, writing some checks to three biggest crooks in the area, and then I can leave after I take a few pictures, and then they'll give me the area on a silver platter. It, the Democratic Party is about taking care of the working class citizens, taking care of our sick, our elderly, our veterans, and then creating opportunities for those who live in poverty to elevate themselves out of poverty with a hand up. You know, and they forgot that. It become about them. And that's why we have lost. That's why we've lost all over. Now, the state of West Virginia, who was absolutely blue, uh, you know, 100 percent, is now red. It's red. And the reason why is because the Republicans capitalized on the fact that we had a lot of people that had been in there for 20, 30 years that literally forgot about the people. But now I'll tell you right now, it's only been it's only taken three years for <laughs> I'm I think we're going to have a blue weave in West Virginia. But let me tell you something. Those of us that are left, the Democrats right now that are in West Virginia, in the House and the Senate, know that we must do right by the people. I will tell you right now, I believe wholeheartedly that the moment that we take back our state, we will be the first state to overturn right to work. We will bring back the prevailing wage. We will, we will raise that natural gas uh, severance tax. And 2.5% is not going to be enough now with the way they acted. We're going to take care of PEIA for our people. We're going to do our best to give people better salaries. You know, there's jobs in West Virginia. The only problem is, is every, one person has to do three of them to survive. Yeah. And that's an issue. So you won, you won your first election with barely any money. Yes. How did you do that? And did your colleagues notice? Like, is that, is that why they're starting to fight for the working party? Like, oh, uh, this, they, this other way can actually Well, they work. noticed after. Right. You know, first off, you know, uh, I won around 4800 bucks is what I, what I used to win my Senate seat. Now, it also, you know, I was actually almost murdered as well. Two days before the primary, hit in the back of the head with a pipe, rolled over while I was unconscious, and they broke eight bones in my face with brass knuckles. He reached into the vehicle and grabbed an object and then ran around and struck me in the back of the head. I honestly remember just closing my eyes, and it was like I was just going to lay down and fall asleep. I went to the hospital not knowing what to expect. I wouldn't let my kids go to the hospital because I didn't know what to expect. Was that the local machine that... Yeah, well, I, well, absolutely, absolutely local machine. And, the, and, and what even shows, you know, shows proof is that nothing really was ever done. The guy didn't do six months, and he did it in a nonviolent facility. When you're part of that clique, you get away with things. And, the, and, the, and, the, and, and even the court system, you know, does that. The prosecuting attorney of Logan County, West Virginia, I told him, do not take a plea deal. I want this to go to court. I want it all to come out. I don't care if, I don't care if, he, if he wins. I want it all to come out on the table. And in my absence, he went and took a plea deal. He agreed to a plea deal that said, we got in a fist fight and I got knocked out, you know, because he was part of the whole thing as well. And then two, a month later when we were in court, he fought the very plea deal that he agreed to because he wanted to show like he was trying to be on my side. He wasn't on my side. And there was, there's never been a real investigation into that. So it, it's a shame. All right. So then you end up winning. Yes. And then you, uh, you, you come to the state capitol. Right. And people start noticing that this is a different kind of kind right. of Democrat. Have you seen people change? Yes, their yes. politics. Since I will then? tell you. I will tell you that you know the reason, the main reason why I won the Senate seat wasn't because I was attacked. It was because I put boots on the ground everywhere. I put sixty thousand miles, sixty thousand miles. 
I put 40000 on my vehicle and 20000 on my buddy's vehicle, us driving around, knocking on doors, doing everything. Uh, we were very active, and <clears throat> that, was, that really helped. People, people said, we've never seen a, a person up in this area. Well, when I become a state senator, you know, I went up there, and you know, I represent 110,000 constituents, and that's who I work for. I don't work for anybody else. I don't care who you are. I don't work for you. I work for the people of my senatorial district right now, and I'm going to work for the people of the 3rd Congressional District here pretty soon. But that's who I work for. And when I got up there, I started looking at what am I going to do, what type of legislation am I going to try to push to help our people. Well, the door opened one day, and a guy walked in named Rusty Williams. He sat down with me, and he said, Sir, would, would, you, would you mind sitting and let me talk to you a little bit about medical cannabis? And we had a great conversation, and while we were having that conversation, the light come on. 22 veterans are committing suicide every day. And I know from things that I've heard and, and read that states that have allowed medical cannabis to be used to help our veterans that are suffering from PTSD, they've saw great results. Mm -hmm. 22 veterans a day that have dedicated their lives, risked their lives for this country, we've got to do everything in our power to make that number go from 22 to zero. So you know what? medical cannabis. And I, and I pushed that bill and I got told, don't even do this. Don't think about it. If you do it, you're going to make a lot of enemies around here. But who are you? Who'd they say the enemies would be? Uh, the Republican leadership. You know, uh, the Speaker of the House was a dictator, you know, who if anybody even so much has done anything against him, he would remove them from their committees. Now, I'm on the Senate side. He's on the House side. Uh, but that's the type of way that they were. You know, and it was all a bunch of, you know, they look at you in the face and they say, hey, we support you. And then behind the scenes, they're doing everything. The, the, the Senate president, Mitch Carmichael, did the same thing. Oh, I believe you wholeheartedly. Well, he's done nothing but behind the scenes do everything. His power to hurt it as well. So, you know, basically, you know, I started pushing this bill didn't care what they had to say and about a couple weeks went by nothing so I went up to the uh, you know Health and Human Resources Committee chairman and I said hey are you gonna run this bill and he looked at me he looked at me in the face and he says uh, big pharma doesn't like it so I looked at him and I said well, I'm not in the pockets of big pharma are you and then I walked back over to my desk and I picked up the microphone and when you pick up the microphone on the on the West Virginia Senate floor every camera zooms in on you and I started busting them out. We have thousands of veterans from this state that have seen things that I pray you or your children never have to see. I've got a dog tag here, and I can remember telling the wife her husband's not coming home to see the birth of their first son because she was eight months pregnant and he was killed in the Al Ambar province. I think about her and what she has to go through. And I can go through every one of these here, and I remember every one of their faces. And I love them like they're my brother. But we can't help them. They died in combat. But we can do something for the first time in the state of West Virginia. We can help our veterans. And I started talking about how, you know what, we're going to sit here and allow people that are suffering from Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, severe ADHD, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's not just soldiers. You show me a firefighter or a police officer that's been in the job for 10 years, I'll show you somebody that suffers from PTSD, that has issues at sleeping at night. You show me a person, that, a woman that was in a battered relationship, I'll show you somebody that suffers from PTSD. A person who was in a horrific car crash where they were the only survivor, PTSD. And there's so many more illnesses that we know for a fact that medical cannabis absolutely can help. And then I wanted to also make sure that we allow people the ability to grow their own medicine in their home for, for mature, for, for seedlings. And you know why? Because we're poor. And a person that works 20 hours a week gets horrible benefits and they may not as well have the ability. But you know what? Poor people get cancer more than rich people because poor people drink from the tap and rich people drink Evian water. So those people get sick and I want to give them the ability to have medicine versus them just struggling and having to suffer through it. You know, and by giving them the ability to grow their own medicine, they got it and they would not allow it to happen. So where'd it go? Where'd the bill go? It passed. It went to the House, and they did a lot of damage. They set it up, and my opponent, Carol Miller, was part of it. You know, they set it up to where the only people who were going to be able to get a license to grow was going to be the filthy rich. 
And you know what? Why not give everybody the opportunity? If they got a piece of land and they want to be able to start their own business and, and, and be successful in life, why not give them the chance? Oh, but no. They only wanted to give it like 30 people were allowed in the state to get the license. Who do you think's going to get them licenses? You know, probably the, the nephew of our Governor Jim Justice. That's probably who's going to get the licenses. You know, so that's not right. Let's give the people the opportunity to benefit from this. Once again, our people have broke their backs for the coal industry, they've, they, they've, they've worked for the timber industry, they're going to break their backs for the gas and oil industry, and in the end, the working class citizens that do all the work will be none the better for it. You show me the richest grounds and I will show you the poorest people. It was them who come into West Virginia, looked us in the face and said, you could be the next Saudi Arabia. And they want it to be Saudi Arabia where everybody, you got 10 people in Lamborghinis and the rest of the people eating sand sandwiches, and I've said this many times before. Yeah. So it's in some ways it's formalizing the, a system that already exists. If you are tight with the sheriff, uh, you know the sheriff is going to give license, not an official li- paper license, but yeah, you know, go ahead, you you grow. Right. No, we're not we're not going to come down on you, but you over here. Well, that, when you're talking you. about politics, that's how it. I mean, it's unfortunately that's what that's what hurt me. I retired from the military and I come home because I thought I was going back to the greatest nation on earth. And we've got people that call themselves leaders that can't spell it. You know, we've got people that, that absolutely do not care about They think leader means you're standing on the top of the mountain and looking down at everybody and they're supposed to do everything to make you better. When I come from, the leader is down there with the people trying to elevate them. You know, where I come from, you don't eat until your troops are fed. I'm a paratrooper. The first person out that aircraft is the leader. And you do that because you show the people standing behind you that's hooked up that you're willing to go first and throw yourself out that aircraft so that they have no reason not to follow you.